Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for being with us this morning. My name's Heidi. And I'm Nate. And I'm Mark. We're the lead team here at Praxis. Um, we're just thinking this morning, Mark, how's things going in lockdown? Oh man, so good. You know, oh squirrel. Uh, <laughs> no, things are just going so good. You know, I've made so many friends over here. I got Billy Bob over here, my new best friend. Hey, Billy Bob, how's it going, buddy? Yeah, I know things are going really, really good. Best it's ever been. Are you sure you're okay, Mark? Yeah, we're doing pretty good over here. Our family's doing great. Thanks for checking in, Heidi. Means a lot. That's good. Thanks for being with us again this morning. Nate, if you don't mind just taking a moment to read Psalm 1 over us. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Psalm 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Thanks, Nate. Before we lead into some worship this morning, just a reminder that when worship is over, we will be taking communion together. So you may want to take a moment now to prepare that for yourselves and then join us in worship. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting there with open arms oh god so love the world that he gave us is one and only some to save us so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save oh god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in forever the 
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world Well hey everybody, it is great to be together today Welcome again to our online gathering And just so thrilled that you can join us and just hope you're managing through this lockdown. I know there's been provincial guidelines that have extended this for us here in Ontario and in London. So we just, we think of you often. Think of, I, I think we, Heather and I think of you daily and are praying for you, praying for our community. We know this isn't fun, but we are, in, and it's really not fun because like Heather's cutting my hair again, which is like the, the lowest of the low that you can go. I mean, I love her very much and I think she does a decent job, but it will be a wonderful day when we can get back to getting our hair cut and and uh, I hear like my neighbor's lawnmower in the back. So it'll be wonderful to be back in the same room. We do long for that, uh, just to worship and celebrate and come together weekly for liturgy and just to be together. Yeah, we want you to know that our hearts just long for that and we do look forward to the day. And we will have a little bit of an update over the next little while, probably the next couple weeks as things we believe with vaccinations kind of spreading out now, um, that we would be able to be back in the same room at some point here in the near future. With all that said, we're just thrilled. Thanks for hitting play. If you're new, uh, my name is Drew. I'm just a leader here at Praxis Church. And we know in these unique times with kind of everything being online that maybe you just stumbled on this. We're just so grateful that you're with us. We do want to let you know that if you want to go to mypraxis.church slash new, there's a little form there and you can fill that out to stay in the loop with all that's happening in our church. But as well, we'd love to send you a gift. So there's a little bit of incentive if you go there just to let us know that you're watching. That would be fantastic. You know, this spring, uh, post-Easter, is really the first time in a long time where we haven't had a teaching series at Praxis. Um, with the new lockdowns and just with the thought of at Easter going back to regular gatherings and then that kind of being squashed, we've just been going week by week looking at some what I feel are really important topics or themes that we need to be looking at. And today we're going to take some time and we're going to talk about racism and the kingdom of God. Last year we had the opportunity to host an event in the summer led by some fantastic people in our church and we had a number of guests come and share called Racism in the Church as we just looked through the really uh, prevalent moments in which there was a lot happening in culture and there still is around race and racial justice and racism. It was a beautiful evening together of learning and taking a posture of listening and I'm just really thankful for the voices that came and shared with us on that evening kind of in that virtual event. And you know one of the things that we just know and we want you to know is that this idea of talking about racism and, and wrestling through it and what the gospel says and the church and its role in just leading the way forward in this is not a one-off event right? It's not just like a one-off talk that we all of a sudden just get past, we leave it in the, in the past. We really believe that this is a conversation that needs to happen over and over and over. And um, we really believe that this is something that we as a church want to not just again put in the past, but it's something that we want to continue to wrestle through and walk through and, and really continue to ask God how we can be part of, a, a, part of the healing in our own city and in our own context around racial justice. So the plan for today is a few things. One, my gr I was saying this, my greatest regret from 2020 is that we didn't record that evening uh, online, that ra um, racism in the church evening. Um, it really is my biggest regret. The reason why we didn't record it is because we really, I, I felt and our team felt that it was really important that people make the effort to be in the virtual room on that evening as we talked about these things. And so people were asking, is this gonna be online? And I was saying, and we were saying, well, it's not. We really want you to make the time uh, to be there on that evening. 
in hindsight, and that's probably a good desire, right? Being together, and it is an important topic to all be kind of in the same room together. But at the same point, uh, now at the same time, in hindsight, I really wish we would have recorded this. Because as part of that evening, we had uh, our very own Nicole Kaniki share a little bit about the history of racism in the church. Not just in culture, but how the church at times has perpetuated this, um, this racism and, and racist ideas and all sorts of things. And so she did uh, just an amazing job at just sharing uh, just around this idea. We didn't record it, so I've actually asked Nicole to come again and open up our time as we talk today by resharing um, just the history on racism in the church. And so I want you to come with a posture of listening. She's going to share for a few minutes. Then we're going to talk about systems of racism. I'm going to invite in a, in a couple minutes, uh, Dr. Esau McCauley is going to come and he's just going to share for a couple minutes on this idea of systemic racism and the importance of looking at that. And then at the end, I'm just going to, for my, myself, just take a couple minutes and just give a couple pastoral reflections around um, this topic and this idea of racism in the church and the kingdom. And we'll talk a little bit about the story of God and how we continue to need to approach this as Jesus followers. So I hope you just hang with us this morning and hang in there and join us. And I know, again, this is a unique environment. It's easy, I'm sure, just to like, I know from week to week, you know, on YouTube, just kind of walk away. But I really pray this morning that you would just be with us in heart, soul, mind, and strength. You just join in with everything you have, and we would come from a posture of uh, listening. So I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Nicole Kaniki. Yes, uh, she is uh, a doctor and a fantastic part of our community. Her and Serge have been a part of what was City View from the very beginning and uh, have been a, a key and integral part of our community. Uh, most recently, Nicole was an equity, diversity, and inclusion specialist at BrainsCan, uh, which is a neuroscience research program here at Western University, and she served in that capacity, I think almost since when she received her PhD. So that's been, over the last few years, she's been serving in that capacity. But hot off the press, um, Nicole now is taken on the role of Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in Research and Innovation at the University of Toronto. And we're just so thrilled for her and uh, this opportunity for her. Uh, Nicole, we just pray blessing on you and this whole transition. We know it's big, but we're just so thrilled that you'll have a voice in this and a continued growing voice in this. So would you just, well, wherever you're watching from, just welcome with me Dr. Nicole Kanik, our very own as she comes and just uh, uh, brings us uh, a little bit of perspective around racism in the church. Hello everyone, Nicole here. Um, today I'm going to be presenting to you a bit of a foundational framework for understanding um, issues of racism. Um, and the church and the relationship basically that racism um, and the church have had for, for decades and centuries before. I find it's really important for us to, um, to know what has happened in the past and how the past is actually connected to our present. Because if we look at what is happening today in the world, it didn't just happen overnight. It's not just one incident of um, George Floyd's death that um, caused everyone to see and to realize that racism still exists in our society today. And so I think it's really important for us to understand where it comes from, how racism still operates and exists within our society today, and especially within the church, um, how, you know, um, just being Jesus followers doesn't make us immune to um, to racism, um, that, it you know, it's something that exists in the fabric of our society and also within the fabric of our church. And that it's something that we really do need to be aware of and understand in order to be able to be intentional um, in our advocacy and in our pursuit of justice as Christians. So just a little bit of a background as well um, about our society. Um, so we're all products of our environment. The individual ways in which we view the world and the beliefs we hold are very much influenced by the way in which we are raised, the people we surround ourselves with, and the different social dynamics and cultures we are exposed to. The way in which uh, we take on our identities as Christians are also heavily dependent on these experiences. The way in which we read, 
understand and interpret the Bible is all influenced by these established systems we have learned from our environment and the people in it. The reality is that our worldviews have been formed in a very particular way. We got much of what we know from our parents, who got it from their parents, who got it from their parents, and so on. There is a history that is central to how we do Christianity, and therefore there is a history to how we do the church. To say that we are pure, that we purely view the Bible in a certain way with no influence from our personal biases would be pride. Therefore, to think that we perfectly treat others the way that Christ has called us to treat others is also a fallacy. We treat some differently than we do others, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. The diagram here I have up shows a circle of what is commonly and culturally believed to be desirable in the inside circle and what is less desirable, both in personal identity and in what we believe to be qualities in others in the outside of the circle. In the world, we treat each other in this way. Research has shown that those in the inside of the circle tend to have more opportunities in life for work, popularity, friendship circles, and lived experiences. It is things like racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on, that are the results of these social hierarchies we live in. As Christians, we are in this world, but we are not of this world and we have been called to live differently than the world. But again, the reality is that many times in our lives, we do not. Even within church circles, people prefer associating with others from certain area codes or parts of the city, or who look like us or our children, or who seem to have made life choices like ourselves. Christians are not immune to looking down on others, but we do have something that the world does not have in dealing with these types of sin. We have Christ. We have the perfect example who pulls us back in and says, no matter how many times we sin, we can be forgiven. And in the Bible, he has provided us with the guidance of confronting these sins and offered an alternative way of living through him. I do not think it is by accident that humility is one of the most valued fruits of the spirit. Without humility and recognizing that we all sin, our salvation would be meaningless. Privilege is what an individual holds when they are a member of some of the characteristics, again, of the inside circle. And different degrees of power are afforded to them when they are able to make decisions and choices without the barriers society has placed on those who hold those identities on the inside of the circle. It is not the possession of that power and privilege that is a bad thing. It is, a way, it is the way in which that power is used over others that makes it harmful. Now, this is foundational to much of what I'm about to discuss, and I'd like you to keep it in mind as I work through this presentation, and, the, um, and I hope that it sort of stirs some rich dialogue for you as well. Now, some of the things I'm going to go over, I've sort of broken up this presentation into um, a couple of important areas that I think um, really sort of resonates with an understanding of racism. And these are colonization. So we'll talk a little bit about colonization. Colonization is basically the concept of um, uh, where uh, European settlers came and took land from indigenous peoples, also killed those peoples of the land in order to obtain it. They also destroyed cultures um, and um, and uh, uh, cultures and communities um, in doing so in order to be able to establish themselves as societies today. It is how Canada was formed. It is how the United States was formed. It is how um, in many countries as well, we have so many sort of European um, ancestry within different um, societies across the world. So the next one is slavery. Um, I think many of us are familiar with the concept of slavery, but I will go over some concepts as well as it pertains to the church. And then segregation, segregation, which was both the um, uh, of sort of official laws and unofficial laws and how society operated post slavery. And then I'll talk a little bit about today's church. And, um, you know, just kind of thinking about, again, what's happening in the world today, it's very relevant as well, and how um, our church actually, you know, um, sort of how racism and the church and the relationship that, that there is today, potentially, um, in how we do church. When European settlers first came to North America in the early 1600s, they were sent to find and conquer land. 
On the mission of the king or queen and with the blessing of the church, they will also on mission to spread the gospel. This is why Christianity is such an integral part of the story of colonization in Canada. Not only did they come to find land and do it through conquering and killing indigenous people, but they also did it under the authority of the church and with a justification of working against the paganism and savagery of indigenous people. This is how the church justified the oppression and murder of indigenous people in Canada under the guise of a civilization at the opposition to the work of God. In later decades, the church in Canada created systems of oppression for indigenous people. And one of these included the forcible removal of indigenous children from their homes and into residential schools where they were stripped of their indigenous identity and made to act Christian. Making an indigenous person Christian at the time was code for making them white or European. In 2008, Stephen Harper said this on the resi um, this of the residential schools. Two primary objectives of the residential school systems were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their homes, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant Christian culture. These objectives were based on the assumption Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, indeed some sought, as it was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. Residential schools were run by Anglican, Pres Presbyterian, United and Roman Catholic churches. Biblical conversion and salvation was used to create and develop the very structure of what we have come to know as Canada. And we see this in the evidence of the last residential schools that closed as late as 1980, uh, 1996. Think for a second of how many indigenous people you see today were still part of the system and are today affected by the trauma from that era. Indigenous peoples have suffered through indescribable atrocities by Canadian society, yet the anti-Indigenous racism that exists when they are labeled today by the horrific stereotypes our society has created. It must make you wonder what responsibility we have as a church in perpetuating this, and then the responsibility we have in doing work against anti-Indigenous racism. Black slaves were brought over to the United States and Canada to provide labor for the newly conquered territory during colonization. The civilization of what we call today our modern economy and society was quite literally built off the backs of African slaves. After having eradicated most of the threat of indigenous peoples, Europeans were able to settle and establish their new world territories on vast lands that brought prosperity and riches beyond what they could have obtained in the European homelands. Slaves were needed to sustain this new way of living. And it is this need to preserve the privileges of being European or white that allowed for the justification of practices of slavery. First, in order for the church to condemn slavery, you would need to prove that they were human beings or slaves were human beings. That they were, and that they were also loved by God. But their dark skin and savage ways meant that surely they were not. And if they were not human, then they did not have souls. So that means they were beyond saving and therefore they were only good for slaving. Their outward appearances and culture made them first not human and therefore incapable of salvation. And then later, only three fifths human and their salvation was subjected to that of their master. In this way, the church was justified in not intervening in slavery and to be complicit to the dehumanization of black, black people in slavery. White purity was in opposition to the humanization of black people. This ideology is what later caused the civil war. And yes, it led to the end of slavery, but the remnants of the ideologies which um, were societal beliefs then did not end with it. Now, slavery in Canada was abolished in 1834, and segregation became the way in which the government and society was able to continue the oppression of Black people and Indigenous people well into modern times. Because segregation itself was not the law of the land, it was the way in which the individual laws, both written and unwritten, of communities across Canada were developed and implemented that restricted Black and Indigenous people from accessing the same education, employment, rights to livelihood, and opportunities in society. 
The problem with segregation in Canada was that because it was not as overt as the laws of Jim Crow and segregation in the U.S., there was limited accountability. How do you destroy something that doesn't exist? For example, the last racially segregated school in Ontario was officially closed in 1965, and the last one in Nova Scotia closed in 1983. Racism is not um, that old in Canada. In the 20th century, however, during the time of segregation, Christian thought actually began to undermine the racial system that it had helped create. The Christian church went through a moral evolution in which it found and accepted the concept of cultural pluralism. In other words, the church began to accept that not all Christians were the same in culture, but that we could all serve the same God as equals despite these differences. The church became an ally in the face of segregation for the most part, uh, for the most part. So evangelical and Pentecostal movements now had spread worldwide and the rapid growth of discipleship across nations could not be denied. At the same time, many white North Americans continued to um, uh, continue to oppose the end of segregation, which to them meant a loss of purity, a way of living that meant they were to be unequally yoked. Movements such as the KKK and continued Nazism that crossed the Atlantic supported these ideologies steeped in biblical theology, which was foundational to their existence. Canadian society has come a long way from, the, from those historical events and eras, but the reality that they exist within the fabric of who we are and what we do is still evident in the experiences of its Black and Indigenous people. While many churches today preach the love of God and equality in the faith, the reality is that we still live in a world steeped in a history we cannot deny. So, Within our churches as well, we see it as evident in, you know, who are the individuals that we look to as, you know, um, both politically as well as in leadership to guiding us within our, um, within our church and within our church communities. You know, what do those leaders look like? What does our church board look like? What does our worship team look like? For racialized individuals, for black and indigenous individuals um, and people of color in Canada, when they walk into your church, do they see themselves? Do they see, you know, do they, they, they see in the children's program, you know, who's leading the children's program? And do they feel safe putting their kids who are racialized into the children's program um, because of who is there? And so the, this is the everyday experiences of um, Black, Indigenous and people of color within the church communities. And we really need to be aware of how inclusive we are and how our church structures, our initiatives, our events, you know, the way we, we do church, um, does it actually invite people in? Is it truly a faith for everyone or is it not? So, you know, again, while many churches today preach the love of God and equality in the faith, the reality is that we still live in a world steeped in a history we cannot deny again. It is more important today than ever that the church recognizes that there are people who continue to live under oppression. Having opportunities like these to discuss races, issues of racism, sexism, homophobia, um, and so forth is an important opportunity and an important dialogue that we need to have because we need to be aware of our biases. We need to understand how the world influences um, how we even do church. And, and we do have a responsibility to ensure that the church of God is a church for everyone. There are churches out there as well today where pastors refuse to even acknowledge the reality of what is happening. They choose to not speak out about or against racism. They use the Bible as justification that we automatically treat each other equally under God. And so racism does not exist in the church. The reality is that we may not be of the world, but we are in the world. And this does not give us an immunity against doing harm to people on the margins, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Well, we are just very thankful for Nicole and the perspective she brings, and not only the perspective she brings, but the research she's done in helping us understand the past. 
And ultimately, we want to look at the past so that we can move forward in the future as the church in re representing Jesus to the world. And so I'm thankful for the work, and we are very thankful for the work that's been done and just making us aware around some of the not-so-good things in the church's history. Again, to take a posture of learning in the present, to move forward in the future, to create a better place and space for the church and for generations to come. And so that work is invaluable. Thank you, Nicole. Now, some of the talk uh, obviously evolves around systemic racism, racism and systems. Um, there's lots of dialogue on, on just in the social world, the social media world around this, and there's church leaders talking about this. I had an opportunity a few weeks ago to be a part of a virtual event, a kind of a conference or workshop around racism in the church and, and all that is involved with that. And uh, part of this conference, or what I don't even really know what you call it, this virtual event, was the participation of a guy named Esau Macaulay, Dr. Esau Macaulay. Esau is a Bible scholar and professor of New Testament at Wheaton College in Chicago and is just a great voice right now. He wrote a wonderful book, an award-winning book over the last couple of years called Reading While Black, and has just had a great voice in just discussing racism, racism in the church, and specifically at this event that I was at, was a question around systems of racism. Basically, somebody asked a question just in regards to the forces that are denying racism right now that go beyond the individual. Um, you know, there's large parts, and in the church, there's large parts of Americans in American society, and this often bleeds into Canadians as well, that have a hard time seeing what a term like systemic racism or systems of racism refers to. And so this question was asked of him, and Esau just did a great job. He talked about how a lot of people are living right now that would maybe deny systems of racism would be living in what he would call an over-realized eschatology. And so he takes a couple minutes and shares about this. And I thought it would just be good for us. I've pulled the clip from this particular event. I just want to let you know the, the video quality itself, it was a virtual event, isn't that great. But I just want us to lean in and listen to how he responds to this. Because I think for some of us, you maybe have people around you that would push against the idea of systems of racism. This is how Dr. Esau Macaulay would respond to this. You know, one of the things that it's really important to do, and I'm just not gonna be able to do it here, is to be as charitable as you can with people with whom you disagree. Hmm. And you try to explain these things over and over again. But sometimes it's also important to expose things to make no theological sense from a Christian perspective. So we're gonna talk as Christians here, right? So we don't believe, over-realized eschatology, the, the phrase means that the, the, the idea that the kingdom of God has been, has been in some sense realized more fully in our current existence than, um, than it is. The, the full transformation of the world um, it awaits God's coming. And so oftentimes, opponent, proponents of people who talk about justice are accused of having an over-realized eschatology. They say that we're trying to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And so what I did is I actually said something a little bit different. And this is what I mean when I say things make no theological sense. And we got to think this through as being rigorously like Christian about this. Christians don't believe that people um, evolve out of sin, that you born with the propensity to commit greed, like because your parents overcame greed, you're not born with the with that ability. You, you, you're born with the propensity to, to, to commit those same sins again. So we don't believe in kind of an evolutionary view of society. We believe that human beings can commit any sin that human beings have ever done. And so we don't have this idea that any particular sin has been defeated, like a race from human existence. So greed, like every society is born with the propensity to like be greedy or lust. These things exist in the world and these things affect the way society functions. Christians don't deny this. This is just like Christianity 101. The only exception to that rule is racism. Christians believe, some do effectively, that we've evolved out of racism. That for the most part, racism is a sin we've dealt with, and it's mostly gone. And that where it does exist, it only exists through interpersonal like animus. But the only way to, to maintain that idea is to say that no one who is racist has social power. 
Because if you have social power and you have a sin, you can you can kind of enforce that sin on the wider society. So, for example, if you're greedy and you want to have power, you can give some of your money to the to lobbyists who then get laws in your advantage. So we can see how greed attached to power leads to laws to disadvantage poor people. So the theory has to be then that nobody in society is racist any in any place that has any social power. That's a strange idea. It makes no theological sense. The other option that you would have to say, because the other thing the Bible says about humans, is that there's spiritual forces in the world. That what we have is not just individual evil, but spiritual powers that corrupt human beings. Well, the idea of the spiritual powers would say, you know what, we used to use racism as a tool for dividing people, but we're going to switch tactics now, and the spiritual powers won't use racism anymore, also makes no theological sense. So the evidence would suggest like the theological differences will suggest, A, there will be centers of social power who have the center of racism, or that there will be spiritual powers that then use racial racism as a way of dividing people. When you add to that, the testimony of actual people of color, Black people, Asian people, Latino, Latina people, and, and they say, I'm experiencing racism. And the Bible and our theology would expect it the reasons for denying it seem to me to have to be ideological, not rooted in biblical text. Because the biblical text would, would, would lead you to believe that you would have a propensity towards this thing, not its elimination. And so even, and I'm sorry, you've, you've asked a question that's going to take a little bit more time. Racism is the only sin that we can be tired of. What I mean is no one says, no church says, I'm tired of telling husbands to be faithful to their wives. We've talked about faithfulness enough. Let's go on to something else. I'm taught about, no, no, like marital faithfulness is something that you fight for the entirety of your marriage from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So racism, just like these other things, like adultery, are things that don't go away, but they're part of an ongoing conversation. Imagine if a pastor had said, I preached my tithing sermon once five years ago and the issue is resolved. Or I preached my parenting sermon once five years ago and the issues resolved. It's only the racial conversation. If we preach once or in the context of tragedy, that gets in the news cycle and then it goes away. Instead of seeing it as an ongoing part of Christian discipleship, as a sin that exists amongst other sins. So what Macaulay shares here is vitally important in not just a personal discussion around systems of racism, but theologically. I hope you caught it here. This is robust. When we talk about, you know, I hear people say they love the Bible, they're committed to the Bible. What Esau is talking about here is deeply rooted in theology. He actually goes on and says that the unique divide that's at play right now between Christian faithfulness or like a devotion to scriptures, between that and suspicion of social action is actually uniquely a, an, an American phenomenon. And I would say that that phenomenon tends to bleed in at times because we're so close to Canadian society. He would just say, this pitting of faithful orthodoxy against social activism when it comes to the response to the gospel. When these things are at odds with each other, it's really only in the American context. He did his doctoral work in the United Kingdom. And for most people even that I have heard from around the world, these two things are not pitted against each other. Faithfulness to Jesus and social action, social justice, or whatever you want to call it, are not pitted against each other. It seems like this is very much an American phenomenon. I just want to remind us of this, but one of the things as we close is I just want to take two seconds here and talk about racism, the meta-narrative of scripture, and the spiritual powers. Because this is often a, a story that is not told when we talk about race and racial justice. If you have a Bible you want to open up to Ephesians 6, I promise we'll be quick. But at the end of the letter to the Ephesians, Paul really breaks it down and begins to tell them to clothe themselves. The imagery is to clothe themselves with the, army, uh, the armor of God. Ephesians 6 verse 10, Paul says this. It'll come up on the screen. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
And then he says this, and you may know this well, but he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What Paul is doing here is he is talking about the powers and principalities that are at play in our world. And maybe you're like me, for years, my imagination was very much turned off to the powers and principalities. I thought of the fall, what which we, you know, the doctrine of the fall in which we see in the, the narrative of scripture as something that happened to humans, that humans are broken and because of their sin and rebellion are now living under the curse in this present age. What I missed, and what we, we've talked, this is no surprise, we've talked about this over the last couple years as a community, is that the scripture continually acknowledges that spiritual beings, or what the Bible calls the powers or spiritual forces, are actually at play, not, in the, not just in the history of the world, but are actually something that are active in our current reality. And this is not out there or spooky, this is just the reality that the fall of humans and then the reconciling love of God is a key theme in the scriptures, obviously, but also a key theme, a key thing that's going on in the scriptures, in the Bible, is this fall of spiritual beings. And now this, these spiritual beings really being hostile towards God and his kingdom. We often call this the unseen realm. Again, we've taught, there's more teaching online if you wanna dive into this more, but this is actually a central theme. You have humans and you have spiritual beings. Now, Paul, in the first century, helping this church live out the way of Jesus, begins to talk about the, the cosmic powers that are at play. Oftentimes, you'll read them in the scriptures as rulers or authorities. The, the Greek word here is a mashed up word that Paul uses. Uh, the word is cosma krator, cosma krator, and really it's mashing two words together. It's mashing the word the world and to grasp together. And that basically gives a picture that these rulers or powers or authorities are these world graspers. These culture world graspers, uh, Bruce Longnecker, who is a theologian, suggests that to, for this to be translated cosmos graspers depicts these figures as selfishly and madly grasping after, after their portion of God's good world without concern for the self-destruction that such strategies initiate. And the picture is, is that these cosmic grabbers are against God and his good world and his intention for creation. And this story needs to be told in light of racism and race, racial injustice. One of the things that we come to, and I know even Esau in his teaching, uh, Esau Macaulay here in his teaching, alludes to this present age and the powers that are at play. This present age is evil. And it is ruled by hostile cosmic powers, including the Satan and the power and authorities, as we've talked about, and sin and death and the flesh. And ultimately, at a cosmic level, this world that we live in, the system of this world, its practices, its patterns, and its postures are influenced by old creation dynamics. And let's not kid ourselves, systemic racism is one of those old creation dynamics that new creation space is bursting forth and ultimately there'll be a drawing of heaven back to earth in the end. This is our theology, but one of the things we have to get in our minds, and even Paul, he deals with this in uh, Ephesians. He talks about taking off the old self and putting on the new self. If you follow Jesus, you've responded to the saving work of Jesus. And one of the calls is, is to live in new creation dynamics that the old creation is passing away and new creation is bursting forth. And yes, we live in an age, obviously, all around us of sin and death, but we are these people, the church, that want to live in the present like we will in the future. I hope you're following with me that old creation dynamics need to go. And as the church community, we are these people that then begin to live into new creation dynamics 
And so again, we, we experience salvation. We experience the saving work of God, but we don't just experience it just to kind of get out of here. The call is, is actually to live now in light of the gospel and this has a lot to say with how we treat our brothers and sisters around us and it has to, a lot to say about systems of oppression and injustice. And I'm just so thankful for this idea that uh, Esau Macaulay has shared. You know, If our brothers and sisters of color are saying this is their experience and the meta-narrative of scripture would say we should expect this because of the fall and brokenness and because of the fall, not only the fall of humans, but of the fall of the spiritual powers, which are both themes in the scriptures, then we need to look and understand and contemplate what these systems can do, being ultimately backed by fallen spiritual forces. I mean, this is a huge part of theology, and I, don't, I hope it doesn't go over our heads, but I do hope that in light of all of this, we would just understand that old creation dynamics need to go and um, that new creation dynamics in our current moment through the church need to be practiced. So that this has to do again with our, our postures, our practices, our patterns, how we live this out. We wanna be people that live in the present like we will in the future. And what I appreciate about Macaulay and what he shared here is that there is a wide swooping narrative that is our theology in how we live this out. You know, as we talk about the fall and brokenness, that humans are fallen, and this is a major thread, that the spiritual powers are fallen and are destructive at working against God and his kingdom. And now, through the saving work of Jesus, we are these ones that respond to his call to be love and light in our world. But I will say this, in all that we've talked about the last number of weeks, I just wanna remind us that our posture towards these things are different, is different than our friends who maybe don't follow Jesus. So I think of creation care, which we talked about a few weeks ago. We do everything we can in the moment, in our current moment, whether that's recycling or stewarding or, or caring for creation in the current moment. But we also live in the reality that we can't bring salvation to this, this issue or topic on our own that we, we do everything we can in the moment, don't get me wrong, we work hard, but we also long for the day when Jesus returns and brings the final saving, not just to our bodies and our souls, but the promises, the scripture says, to all of creation, that the king will return and all of creation will be renewed. You following me? We work hard in the present, but we long for the day when Jesus brings complete renewal and complete salvation. The same when we talked a couple weeks ago about violence, you and I work uh, incredibly hard as Jesus followers to be nonviolent and non-resistant and creative. Actually, the picture we get in the Sermon on the Mount is that we are to be creative in our response to violence. But we also know that us being nonviolent doesn't do everything. We need the king to come and to return and to renew all things. And in the process, what's gonna happen with our bombs, our bullets, our guns, our swords, as the picture is, they're gonna be melted into plowshares, that they'll be melted away and we will cultivate forever in peace. So we live right now in the present like we will in the future, but we can't bring total salvation. You and I, in all the work that we do, the posture that we come from differently is we say we lean into a king who will bring complete salvation. Just like woman and what the stuff that we talked about last week around woman, that Jesus came and subverted the religious system and the culture of the day. He let woman move from woman space in the home to male space and sit at his feet as a rabbi. That they could be disciples learning at his feet. I mean, this in the first century was utterly mind-blowing. And so we as the church are people that say women are welcome to the table, they're welcome to lead and, and in the kingdom of God can play in any area. But we also know that a lot of disorientation and a lot of divide around this area ultimately in the end will be dealt with. Jesus will come and he will restore and renew all things and even in this area where women have often been pushed to the side culturally, Jesus will continue and on that day when heaven comes to earth, we'll welcome women to the table. We live in the present like we will in the future and the same needs to be said for this idea of racism. We work hard to be a voice for the voiceless. 
we believe that this is a gospel issue. We own the past. I'm so thankful for Nicole coming and sharing the history. We, we own our past to move into the future as a community. But one thing that's different than our friends that may not follow Jesus is we know that with this topic or this issue of racism in our moment, in our current moment, we can't do it all. We can't. We work our tails off uh, to see racial justice happen, but we also long for Jesus to come and renew all things. And ultimately in the process, Jesus bringing heaven to earth will wipe every tear, tear away. Again, that's not to say we don't work here and now, just the difference is we don't believe we're the saving force behind this. We actually believe in the, the, the totality of scripture. The whole story of God is leading us somewhere and that's towards renewal. We work hard now, but we long for the king to come. We do everything we can. We will be a church community that won't just have one-off seminars about this or a morning, a morning focus. We will continually, just like as Esau Macaulay said, you can't just talk about parenting or, or uh, greed just once. We will continue to talk about this over and over and over as a response to say, we are longing for that day of salvation. We are saved, but we are longing for Jesus to fix it in totality. And that's just the one thing I would say that's missing from our friends who don't follow Jesus. There's a certain idea that we can just all of a sudden just bring a utopia here and now. We say we work our tails off, but we are longing for final salvation and the renewal of all things. That's our hope. And that's what we wanna call you into. That's what we wanna call our community into. Into uh, following Jesus again, we say it almost every week with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, uh, this week I was running. I know it doesn't look like I run, but I, I run almost every a day. I love long distance running, especially right now because I am headmaster of Fest Virtual School. We have four kids in virtual school and uh, somehow I have been designated the headmaster, which is like a full-time job on its own amongst like other things like full-time work. Um, and so I tend to get out at least for 45 minutes, an hour a day, and I go on a run. A lot of times I listen to podcasts, but sometimes I'll listen to music. And this week I was listening to a new song, a new worship song that uh, you would know the church pretty well that produces a lot of uh, music. And it's really, actually, I'm really thankful for them that the music they produce is really good. And a lot of times it just brings a posture of worship when I'm running. And so this week I was running and I was listening to this new song. And the worship leader, who's a great guy from what I, what I know of him, was calling on the live audience in this song to kind of press in and go deeper and one of the things that he said is he called people and he said, as we sing and as we press in, he said, it's going to cost you. It's gonna cost you as we worship. And I just got thinking about that. You know, I honestly, we long to be back in the same room worshiping together and singing together. We can, I've already said it, I think, at the beginning. We cannot wait for that day. I can't wait to be back in the same room singing and worshiping together and singing unified songs together. I love that. But, you know, I'm not sure that singing together really costs us anything, to be honest. You know, I think about my childhood growing up in youth camp, the pastor at the front calling us to go deeper. You know, the common phrase, well, this is gonna cost, this type of worship is going to cost you something. To be honest, worshiping with 500 other people in a room, let's be honest, it doesn't really, it doesn't cost us much. And again, I love, I love singing together. We'll do it forever. I can't wait to be back in the same room. But you know what will cost you something? Speaking truth to lies that will cost you something. And really, I think in our moment, that is really one of the truest forms of worship. It's gonna cost you something, go deep. Okay, I get it, I get it. We, we'll sing and worship, but what's really gonna cost you something is speaking truth to old creation dynamics. What's gonna cost you is living out new creation dynamics in a world that is drunk on old creation dynamics. What's gonna cost you is speaking truth to lies. And I think this is one of the things we've wanted to do as we've talked through these things the last number of weeks. Whether it's creation care, whether it's violence, whether it's a uh, woman seen as kind of second class, which is, we just say the church has a better story at hand. 
or whether it's around racism and racial injustice. Speaking truth will, will cost you something. I want to invite you as a follower of Jesus into this kind of worship. This is the kind of worship I think God is after. To close our time together, um, I mean, there's so much that could be said. Oh, man, I'm just so thankful again for Nicole. And though we don't know Esau, just, just that frame that he brought for us. But we're going to end our time coming to the table. And I just think as we've talked about these different issues over these weeks, what the table gives us a picture of when it comes to everybody is welcome. And this is what lit up the first century, that the church was this place where there were people from different backgrounds and places in life. They would come and the central thing they would do is they would eat together. It didn't matter what background you were from, what color of skin you were, you would come to the table and you would eat and, and eat together in Jesus' name. This is why actually in 1 Corinthians, Paul freaks out because there was some issues in one of the churches in Corinth where they, there was no social solidarity at the table. The poor were being left out. Certain classes were being left out, left out. Paul loses his mind as he should. And I just think as we gather bread and wine or the bread and cup together today, if any day and anything we talk about, the table reminds us that all of us are welcome. You're welcome today, brothers and sisters. And as we sing and as we reflect on this song and as we take the bread and cup, may, may we be reminded that you and I are welcome, that God is bringing us together and that this story needs to be told. This is what sets us apart as the Jesus community. We have some things to own from the past, but as we move forward, our story is that Jesus and his work invites us to the table and everybody is welcome. From the cross, you made a table, making room for all of us. Though the feast is never ending, we will never know the cause. Your scars, you build redemption.
Thanks for being with us. It's so great to be together in the morning, even if it is a little bit different. Um, and let me just bring a little bit of a blessing to you this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you his peace in your going out and your coming in, in your laying down and your rising up, in your labor and in leisure, in your laughter and in your tears. Have a great week. We'll see you next week, guys.